Hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome. I guess I have to put this on some. Oh, this is the biggest crowd that's attended a systems meeting, so it's a pleasure to have you all here. It's a nice topic, so I think that's probably why that we've got a larger crowd. Um, it is an exciting time for systems, as we'll see in a moment when we look at the plans for systems 3.0. But I'd like to uh, take the first bit of this uh, and introduce you to some of the things that we've done in this last year and in the years before, sort of a look back, and Greg will come up as the incoming director and uh, tell you about systems 3.0. So, for those of you who've not been here before, can I have a show of hands who this is their first meeting? Okay, good. So, this slide's for you. So, you know, I have dozens of different slides that talk about the various things that underpin our science. Um, but I chose this one because it provides a pretty overview, but it also engages in some of the systems 1.0 and 2.0 um, goals. And as Michael just alluded to, we're moving into uh, more uh, coupling into the human domain. But I think everyone should understand at least that these are the goals that, help that form systems uh, 1.0 and 2.0, such as, you know, talking about the different transport processes and their interactions uh, with their environment. And of these processes, you know, which of them are self-organizing and, you know, what are the pattern formation? It talks about material fluxes and surface evolution and deposits. Uh, so there's a geological side that has driven uh, some of our activities. And then there's this really big coupling that has always been with us but it, we're now taking it to the new level, which is coupling between uh, the physical, the ecological, and the human processes. And even the outside domains that influence all of that, which are the Earth's interior and Earth's atmospheric dynamics. We covered last year was climate, so that was to try to get a handle on those kind of interactions. For many of you, you obviously haven't seen this, but this is how systems two, Point oh has been functioning. You know, we have a number of things that we need to get done and, and we need to maintain, such as making sure our community is active, engaged, and all of these other uh, activities. So let me just quickly walk you through a few and point out what I consider the, the salient point uh, for each. So this is our governance structure. We're we're basically a community of communities, and we have working groups, we have focused research groups, and they're quite large in size, you know, hundreds of people who are part of each of them. But then there are these individual projects, and that's what I want to concentrate on. So for every dollar that we get at the integration facility to by NSF to sort of manage this whole thing and develop some of the middleware and software, NSF has handed out $13 for every dollar um, to individuals and teams for their uh, affiliated systems projects. So that's a force multiplier of 13.1. And when you add the other agencies, you know, systems has served a large community. Its impact is much larger than the initial grant uh, cooperative agreement with CSDMS. So this is a slide that I've also not shown before um, because I never knew this. Uh, so this is the population by country. And we knew we had, I, had, I knew we had 69 countries. I knew what our growth rate was, about 150 persons a year. And I've been showing, you know, where the people are have choosing to populate themselves in these various working groups. But this, the country is, uh, side of things is, sort of new for me and I'd like to share it with you. So, you know, two thirds of our membership comes from the US and, and this is both government uh, agency uh, scientists as well as uh, academic uh, people and those from industry. 
And then there are the countries, and I don't think the countries that are next highest up are, should be of any surprise. Um, if I was surprised at any of this, I have some German colleagues in the audience, is that uh, there weren't a lot of Germans who choose to be members of CSDMS. So we have to change that somehow, um, given their population. So I'd like to welcome uh, four new co-chairs. Uh, the first one is Kim DeMutzert, who's uh, co-chairing the Ecosystem Dynamics Focus Research Group. Where's Kim? There we go. And uh, Moira Zellner, the Human Dimensions Focus Research Group. Hi, Moira. And Mary Hill, um, who can't be here right today, but she's coming a little later on in another day or two. She'll, she will be here. Uh, who's going to co-chair uh, Hydrology, the Focus Research Group, and then Scott Peckham. Scott here? No, Scott's not here either. Uh, who's co-chairing with Tom, the Cyber Numerics uh, Working Group. And since this last year, we've had a number of models that have uh, come into the system. And what I'm listing here in the domains is these are sort of the basic domains. Uh, some of these are both terrestrial and coastal. Some of them are coastal and marine, et cetera. Some of them are hydrological and terrestrial. But those are the models that we have entered into our repository. And we have not quite as large, but we have a lot of heavy code tools that are associated with some of these models or can help other models. And then we have this compliant uh, side of things. And the compliance side is for those models that have been refactored, altered, uh, wrapped, whatever way you want to word it, so that they can be in a plug and play modeling uh, world that we've been putting together. So I want to thank all the new contributions. These are the models that came in this last year. And, and for those of you who have not seen sort of the world of modeling that we've been in, and I don't want to go through it all. It, some of them are Lagrangians, some of them are direct numerical simulations, some of them are social or local or time marching, et cetera. So systems has always been a community of communities. And in this community, there is a wide variety of, of models and languages that they operate. For each model that's submitted to our uh, repository, uh, the integration facility does a few things on behalf of the, that submission. We can start and usually start uh, for all of our models. We've done this uh, citation indices for both model overview papers and model application publications. So you can get an, uh, a credit for writing models. This is something that I've been pushing academic community to recognize. So it's not just scientific papers, but it's actually the models themselves that should be credited. Um, our model metadata uh, with its digital object, object identifier for each stable model, we now provide this. And by doing this, um, uh, this has really helped. Uh, and we've been working with the um, various publishers to make sure that when people publish a paper with a model in it, people can reproduce that model. They can reproduce it. Uh, in such a way that uh, we can get back to what is called normal science, because in the past, without the code, you would have a model paper that could never be reproduced. So we thought that was a mistake, and we worked hard to try to sort that out. So obviously, all the code that comes into a repository is open source, and our version control we use is um, GitHub. Quick word on our soon-to-be-retiring uh, supercomputers. Janice has already retired, but we brought in these supercomputers um, uh, in three stages. First, there was Beach. That was the largest on our university for a short time. And then there was Janice, and then now there's Summit. And uh, Beach has, we've been keeping Beach afloat uh, much longer than its shelf life. So that'll be the next one that we uh, replace. We replaced Janus with Summit. But if you look over this last uh, 10 years of uh, supercomputers, uh, you'll notice that not only are the teraflops uh, uh, 
computational uh, uh, speeds that we can attain uh, increase over time. But the entire architecture has really changed. This is always a challenge for modelers because modelers like a stable hardware platform from which they can write code towards. So if the hardware keeps changing, we have to adopt. And that's why we put on these clinics for uh, helping people use HPCCs. And now you can see our interconnect uh, bandwidth is so large in our new systems. It's not just clock speed, it's not just number of cores. In fact, you can see the number of cores have gone down, yet the teraflop speeds have gone up. Um, we put on a number of, uh, in our educational repositories, we work with the community to take what you have developed and what we developed internally and make sure that we can sort of spread the word, the domains, whether it be uh, creating new student labs that you can download and run on your behalf and in your classes or short courses or lectures or whatever the, uh, the method is. We have our own YouTube channel. So please, if you've not experienced our educational EKT uh, side of our web domain, please go there, have a look around and use it. We put on a number of special issues. I think this one that we're attending right now deserves a special issue. So you may want to talk amongst yourselves and whether you think that, you know, the social um, service dynamics community can get together and put a special issue out in an appropriate journey. In our EKT that uh, uh, Irina Overeem is trying to develop this quantitative toolbox, she wants to tag the concepts that come in that you may submit in terms of concepts, discipline, domains, level, and model difficulty progression. Because you need to know that when you're giving a first year uh, student uh, course and they have a lab and you're using one of our things, you know that this is something that you can use or it may be more appropriate for graduate students. So uh, please work with us on trying to make this uh, system happen. It'll help all of us in our academic teaching pursuits. So one of the things that we've done is we've looked at how models have been written and how model coupling systems have uh, sort of combined, allowed one model to talk to another one model. And there is this thing that's been around for a long time called IRF. IRF is initialized, run, or advance, finalize. But a couple of the systems have this get value, set values. When you do that, you can have your models wrapped in such a way that they can enter the plug and play world. And I've shown this slide many times, and there's this blue arrow that basically indicates that once you've done one, you've done another, you can then allow these models, when there, where there's an appropriateness of either subject matter or need to couple them. But I never tell you about the blue arrow. The blue arrow is actually quite a complicated arrow. And so I thought on my last time up here, I would tell you a little bit about the blue arrow. The blue arrow is quite complicated. It is uh, really the guts of the middleware that has been developed over the last uh, 10 years by CSDMS. And I, if, if you bear with me for a moment, I want to walk you through some of this. So when we get a model written in any of our open source languages, C, C++, Python, Java, Fortran, any of the Fortrans, this model needs to be BMI'd. It needs to be put into this IRF uh, get set system. So we've developed ways to help all of you do that if you're a model developer. We've put a builder in place, we've put templates in place, and we have a tester that allows us to test whether it really meets the standards. And then you end up with a BMI model. So once you have a BMI model in our system, then it needs to be Babelized. So a uh, systems Babelizer is, uh, allows a BMI model to speak Python. And it does that through some pretty heavy, sophisticated code. It's Babel, the language neutral compiler, that spits it out in, in, in one model into any of the other languages. 
And in our case, we've chosen one language. So no matter what the languages are coming in, we spit out one language called Python. And we make that BMI model a Python component. And together with the BMI metadata, we can allow it to get into um, the uh, Python modeling tool called PyMT. And then that will allow it to get into the web modeling tool. And if you're just a user, not a model developer, the only thing you may see is this last box called WMT client, which is your browser GUI. But there's a lot of magic that goes on here. In fact, it's, there are, these are new concepts. As Eric will show you tomorrow, and when he provides his, uh, with Greg, the keynote on uh, BMI, you can actually take a model and in PyMT change the model and its whole structure without actually touching any of the code. So you actually don't need a couplet with another model. You just need to get it into this PyMT to make things happen. And he'll show you a little bit about that next. So it's a whole new concept. And we have a bakery repository that allows uh, you to get access to our recipes, pre-built binaries for all of your components, tools, and models. And of course, again, something we don't often talk about you can't have one model talk to another model if they actually can't agree on what discharge is or what units discharge are, or even what discharge means and there's called. So we have standard names. And uh, these standard names uh, have a method that's being picked up now by uh, other groups. And it's really important that this becomes part of how the semantics and how one model can talk to another model. We've also worked on, and there's a clinic on this, on getting um, uh, Dakota, our, our DOE uncertainty tool, to, to get it to be much more useful. And so we've been BMIing various portions of uh, Dakota so that they can be used in this plug and play world. And we've been pushing ahead on the uh, benchmarking and our first off uh, with is supporting this ILAM, this, uh, uh, benchmarking tool that we've been developing for permafrost exercises and work. So, some of the history back in 2002, 15 years ago, there was about 60 people that I came to a meeting here, and uh, you can see some of the young faces that were there then. I still had an old face back then. Um, and the, the core concepts that we move forward with uh, was developed from this first meeting and elected from that meeting was a bunch of representatives to go to the agencies in DC, NSF, NOAA, USGS, uh, ONR, all these various agencies. And uh, they were to sell the contents of that first meeting. They sent, the agency people sent us back to then write the implementation plan and a few, a few years later, we were funded. So if you look carefully up in a tree, you will see Brad Murray, who's going to become our new chair, freshly elected. You also see Pat Weiberg and Brad as one of these leaders. This group has been giving their blood, sweat and tears to systems for a very long time. So I would like to thank Pat for her great contributions. And I would like to welcome Brad uh, for the task of keeping this organization on track. So I'm not going to walk you through this history, but this is a history where you can see we developed the integration facilities, our first HPCC, the plans, the repositories, the various tools started coming out. New uh, HPCCs came online. And we walked our way through these various developments to get us to where we are today. Uh, and hopefully this will lead us to a submission in the near future for Systems 3.0 and uh, new visions and goals for various working groups uh, and focused research groups. 
And since this is my last time, I have to say the following. This group that you're looking at here is some of the most talented, kind, and generous people that I've had the pleasure to work with around the world, and I owe them everything. And so uh, please join me in thanking them for their contributions to, to where we are today. And, and if you need to uh, see any of them, or you, you have any needs, please see one of them for, uh, to support you. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. It's, um, it's, uh, it's great to see you all. I want to tell you a little bit about plans for the next phase of CSDMS, CSDMS 3.0. Um, before I launch into what that's about, let me make a couple of observations. One is that CSDMS is still growing. Um, this is sort of remarkable to me. Jai mentioned that, that the membership has grown by about 150 people per year. Um, that's shown in this chart here, extending back to 2008. And, and uh, if you had asked me 10 years ago to predict, I would have said, well, after a few years, this will level off. We've found our community. People are, those who are interested have joined. And yet, uh, it's a straight line pointing upward. So that says something about the level of excitement and enthusiasm um, among you, the community. A second point is, uh, has to do with the diversity of this community. So if you look at a distribution of membership in our various working groups and focus groups, um, right away you recognize that just from the titles of the groups that this is a remarkably diverse community in terms of its interests. So, you know, for instance, uh, among you all are people interested in long-term tectonics and geodynamics, the building of mountain ranges. Um, there are people interested in ecosystems, fisheries, vegetation. There are people interested, of course, in human dynamics and human systems. Now, the National Science Foundation is, is very interested in the concept that they call convergence, which they define as the merging of ideas, approaches, and technologies from widely diverse fields of knowledge to stimulate innovation and discovery. This is one of the sort of 10 big ideas that NSF has recently put out. And I think that, that this community actually has a credible claim to be achieving convergence in its diversity and its eagerness to work together and share ideas. Okay, so a year ago today at this meeting last year, um, we asked you all those who were in attendance then to uh, get together in a group of uh, a series of breakout group discussions and to help shape a vision for what systems 3.0 might look like. And in the years since then, the integration facility has uh, sat down, collected the notes from those conversations, worked with the working and focus group chairs to try to craft those ideas into uh, a vision of Systems 3.0. And that has now been translated into a draft proposal that we hope will be submitted to NSF sometime in the coming months um, to support the integration facility for a Systems 3.0. So I want to tell you a little bit about what the outcome of those conversations has been. First of all, the, if, if we try to sort of synthesize a high level view of the science that comes out of this, um, uh, we've tried to encapsulate it in the, the phrase you see here with the white arrow, model data synthesis in earth surface science and applications. So it's a little bit of a mouthful, but those words are carefully chosen. First, model data synthesis. This reflects a view that came out of those discussions last year, that one of the key opportunities before us lies in bringing our computational models together with the rapidly expanding number, quality, and resolution of data sets that pertain to the Earth's surface and its dynamics. I'll say more about that in a minute. The second part here, science and applications, reflects um, the view that emerged from these groups that we can and should be doing more as a community to embrace applications, to bring um, systems models and systems expertise to bear in the applied world where the state of the art 
models are not always state of the art. So those two things together gives us our theme. Another way of casting this is that we're seeking to move toward a more predictive science of the Earth's surface, where predictive here means not just forecasting the sort of sedimentary weather tomorrow, but it means um, prediction in the broadest sense of a good scientific theory is one that predicts the observations. So let me say a few words about model data synthesis and data opportunities. Last year at this meeting, um, there was a poster presentation that talked about a project called Arctic DEM. So this is one of a few examples I want to share with you. Uh, Arctic DEM is uh, an audacious project designed to create high resolution digital elevation models of um, the Arctic. High resolution meaning a few meters per grid cell. The Arctic meaning literally the entire Arctic landscape. That's what makes this an audacious project, and they're doing it with satellite photogrammetry. Now, this is an example of a data set. That means that we are now on the verge of having, for this part of the world, um, high-resolution images of the landscape that can be repeated. They can be regenerated as long as the satellites keep flying. That means that we can do change detection, and this is a place where change is happening fast, as we know. So whether your interest is in coastline retreat or thawing permafrost, or um, shifting river networks, um, we're on the cusp of being able to measure those changes in a way that we never could before. Um, another example comes from LIDAR. So LIDAR has been with us for, I guess, two decades or so now as a technology. But of course, as you know, its, it's applications are rapidly growing. Its coverage is expanding fast. Some states in the US have LIDAR coverages. Um, uh, a lot of countries now are acquiring LIDAR for things like coastlines and river corridors, so the coverage is increasing fast, and it too is repeatable. Um, and it too raises interesting opportunities in change detection. So you're looking at images now from some, some of Mariela Perignon's work. If you look at the sort of bluish figure, um, that's showing an image a difference image between two LIDAR data sets collected five years and one big flood apart from one another. And this is an image showing in detail the patterns of sedimentation along a floodplain that resulted from a large flood. You know, when I was a grad student, we never had a prayer of having anything like this. To collect a data set like this would have been a major investment in time and money. Um, so this too is an opportunity in change detection and it means increasingly as modelers, we're not gonna have the excuse to say, well, my model looks a little bit like a river, right? It's gonna have to be how much like this particular river and its dynamics over this period of time does your model capture? So it's gonna, data like this are gonna push us to the limits of predictability possibly. Another example from the coastal realm, um, this comes from Chris Sherwood. Um, Chris showed some of these data last year um, and you're looking at a digital elevation model of a stretch of the Cape Cod National Seashore that was obtained using drones and cameras on poles with structure from motion photogrammetry. Um, I'm sure some of you are, are interested in, in using structure from motion now. It's a relatively new technology that makes high resolution surveying of topography fast and cheap, much faster and much cheaper than it used to be. Um, Again, change detection becomes a real and affordable possibility. Again, pushing our models to say, not my model looks like a coastline, but my model resembles this change in this stretch of coastline in these ways, and it fails in these other ways. Uh, the world of bathymetry is also um, part of this data revolution, whether it's from, uh, you know, submersible drones and improving quality of Sonar technology, we're getting better and better images of the submarine world as well. Here's an image of the Baltimore Canyon trough at a resolution of five or 10 meters per grid cell. So all of this makes change detection and modeling of change detection and testing of models um, much more feasible and powerful than it was just five years ago. Now, not all of us deal with, many of us deal with processes that happen in scales of our lifetime, and some of us extrapolate them into the geological record, right? A geological time scale. We think about mountain building, we think about sedimentary archives and things like that. 
But there too, we have a data revolution, not so much in our ability to live for 10 million years and measure things over that time, that would be cool, um, but in the form of experiments. So we have with us today at this meeting, um, representatives from the Sediment Experimentalist Network, so welcome to you all. Um, these are some of the uh, experiments that the SEN group has produced. And what's interesting here is not so much that experiments are happening. Experiments in sedimentology and geomorphology and related fields have been undertaken for a long time. But what's new is that we can now actually measure their dynamics very precisely. Um, so in sort of, sort of visualizing and, and teasing our visual imagination, it's also captured digitally. We can capture stratigraphy evolving landscapes evolving in a controlled laboratory setting. And we have no excuse not to be testing our models in these controlled environments. So a wealth of data that we didn't have when systems was first launched, and that's a huge opportunity. So in a way, the challenge moving forward then is to embrace this and other opportunities um, while also sustaining the, the good things that the integration facility has, has created and that are of value to the community. And doing that in uncertain budgetary times, right? Um, so doing it, if we're lucky, on a flat budget. So that, that's the challenge that the integration facility is gonna be grappling with over these, these next months. Now, talking about some of the ideas that, that we have on, on, on track for Systems 3.0, that again, came out of your vision last year, um, it's useful to think about the CSDMS integration facility activities in terms of three pillars, right? These are sort of three core areas that, um, that systems works on. And they reflect three things that many of us do in our, um, in our science, scholarship, engineering, and so on. First of all, we, we collaborate with one another. That's partly why we're here. We share resources, whether it's model codes or data sets or whatnot. And that's the community piece. Those of us who work with computational models, we do models. We run models, we write models, we debug models, and we need computers to run them on. That's the computing piece. And then finally, many of us are educators and all of us are learners. And that's true whether we're just starting out, we're, we're just learning how to do basic programming, we're learning numerical computing and so on, or whether we're interested in, in learning a new specialized technique, whether that's you know, the latest advances in computational fluid mechanics or it's agent-based modeling of human systems. We're all learners. That's the education piece. So I wanna talk about some ideas for Systems 3.0 um, in each of those three pillars and I'll start in reverse order with education. I won't go through each of these items in detail. The, the key is that the, the light text is things that Systems is doing now and will continue doing. The heavy text is sort of new ideas. Um, one of the messages that came out loud and clear from last year's breakout group discussions was that um, clinics at these meetings are great, but there's only so much you can learn in two hours. So there is an appetite for uh, more in-depth training opportunities. And one idea that emerged from at least one breakout group um, was the concept of summer schools, some kind of um, fairly intensive uh, training opportunity to bring people up to speed with best practices in scientific computing and applications. So we hope to launch that in Systems 3.0. These will be probably something like 10 day summer courses. Um, let me say a few words about computing resources. Um, there's a lot to say about computing, more than we really have time for now, but um, let, me, let me highlight three things. First of all, the data challenges, um, mean that we need better ways to bring models and data together, whether it's ingesting data set into a model or it's comparing model outputs with data to try and figure out how well a model did. Um, that calls for tools to help that process along and so we hope to be able to create something like a basic model interface for data sets uh, and to enhance GIS capability. So if you need to project a data set or project a model output so you can compare them with one another. Let me say a word about Beach. So Jai talked a little bit about supercomputing resources. Um, what's unique about Beach, of course, is that it is dedicated to this community. It's specifically for 
CSDMS users, and it a, has a sort of a low barrier to entry. It's a starter system. As John mentioned, the uh, beach facility is aging and it needs to be replaced. And so we hope to partner with research computing here at CU Boulder um, to create um, essentially a, a chunk of a modular system that they maintain um, that will probably have fewer cores, at least initially, than Beach does, but those cores will be a lot faster, connections will be a lot faster, and the memory will be a lot bigger. So we hope to see improved performance with that. And then finally, let me mention the Python modeling tool that Jai also mentioned. Um, this now exists as a, as a beta product, and Eric is gonna show you a demo of that tomorrow morning. Um, we hope to turn it into a full featured project uh, product that that you can use in doing your science. And we'll talk about why it's, we'll show you some examples of what makes this such a cool and useful tool tomorrow morning. Finally, the community end of things. Again, lots of ideas came out of last year's discussions and we've tried to synthesize them. Um, one thing that became clear is that um, many people in our community are interested in cold regions, whether it's glaciology or it's thawing permafrost or it's Arctic coastal retreat. And CSTMS has never sort of formally recognized that area of activity. So we hope to do so by forming a cryosphere focus group to complement our existing suite of focus groups. Um, let me also say a few words on the idea of science teams. So as Jai mentioned, the working in focus groups are big. The smallest group has something like 70 odd members in it now. The biggest has over 700, right? So that's a big job for the group chairs to manage. And yet we want to provide, uh, we're, we're hearing from, from many of you that you want to become more closely involved. Right? You want to contribute um, in some fashion. Um, so one of the ideas that came directly out of one of the breakout groups last year was, look, what about the idea of forming teams within the groups? Um, these are people who volunteer their time to engage in one or more projects on behalf of the broader community each project year. And those projects could be anything from wrapping a model, to writing a group proposal, to doing a multi-authored review paper, um, and many other kinds of things, proof of concept study and what have you. Um, so that provides a, a venue to sort of recognize your contributions and, and provide a way for, um, for broader participation um, while honoring that formally, um, and also providing a mechanism by which um, we the community can do projects that directly benefit both your science and the broader base of infrastructure um, that CSTMS supports. So stay tuned in the coming months for more information about um, the process for applying to join a group or nominating your, your colleagues to, to join. So that's a quick sneak preview of some of the um, some of the things that we have on tap. Again, that's a direct outgrowth of, of the discussions that were held last year. Uh, if you have further thoughts, we would um, greatly welcome them. Um, just pull an integration facility person aside during this meeting or send us an email at systems at colorado.edu. So back to Jai. So I won't even put this, I won't even put this on. Maybe I should, I don't know. Um, so uh, here we are at this meeting. Uh, it's called the Dynamic Duo. And uh, I think it's gonna be an exciting time. But let me tell you a little bit about uh, how we got here in the first place. So, you know, uh, we had a meeting here last year. Uh, it was, uh, linking earth system dynamics and social system uh, uh, modeling. And it laid uh, the bulk work, uh, it was Comtes also co-sponsored that. Um, I guess we're having some mic problems. Um, anyways, uh, this small group forged some very interesting ways forward and they came up with a list of ideas that I think are worth pursuing by our community. You know, from the natural hazard side of things to migration, to how uh, various, uh, we deal with various um, 
uh, low frequency, high energy events. And uh, that white paper went around, and so I think all of you will have seen some copy of that uh, as members. There was a follow-up meeting just months later in Kyoto uh, that broadened that group, which was uh, sort of uh, less of an international uh, uh, group of folks. And uh, this Kyoto meeting was uh, part of the uh, a Future Earth uh, initiative, and that Future Earth, Earth initiative um, under the auspice of the analysis integration modeling of the Earth System AIMS project. And so that's that group of people you see there in that met in Kyoto, and they really pushed, you know, what are the barriers for um, that the social scientists are facing when they are developing their models. Right now, they're locked into, many of them, agent-based models or integrated assessment models, and they really have a hard time uh, interacting with the kind of modeling that we all are doing. So uh, that meeting really uh, brought out some of the finer points. And then there was a, a follow-up meeting at uh, Potsdam, as Michael said, integrated modeling of the social environmental systems. This was a real blueprint forward way of trying to get that community to uh, make advances. And now there's this meeting. Um, so um, we will have an opportunity to meet later today in fact, after a few more keynote speakers, to really finally get sort of the surface dynamics community with populated with social scientists who are going to be leading this effort and reporting to try to get your thoughts into these developing white papers. Now, the developing white papers, I don't know for many of you folks if, if you've uh, all experienced writing them, they almost always lead to some agency turning on money. And so whether this money is at NSF or whether it's in the international community, I think it's really important that uh, you, you get the opportunity to put your thoughts down. And no matter how young you are in your career, your thoughts matter. So please attend this uh, breakout session and to get your thoughts recorded. You will notice that we have um, um, clinics every day. And if you uh, forgot which ones you've signed up for, you can look at the back of your tag and see which ones you signed up for. Uh, we have limitations on some of our room sizes, so tr please try to attend the uh, clinics you were suggested you were going to attend. We have. Uh, Plenary keynote speakers. Every year that we have these plenary keynote speakers, they've been given advice on how to make their presentations so that together there is a coherent way forward. Uh, and you can find all of these presentations online. So I, I really urge you to, uh, uh, to attend these keynote uh, talks that will include some award-winning student talks. And then we have poster sessions uh, on today and tomorrow. And we will vote. You will all vote. Uh, as my father used to say, vote early, vote often. Uh, vote for the best uh, poster so we can hand out the award at our banquet. And so um, the, the group that will meet, the focus research groups and breakout groups, they each have their own individual uh, attendance structure. Again, uh, we hope you, you attend them and make sure that they can start uh, developing the visions for Systems 3.0. And finally, my last slide is to let you know that we have three outstanding winners today uh, for, our, for this meeting. Mike Ellis are winning the uh, Program Director Award for 2017. 
uh, Julia Moriarty uh, winning the Student Model Award, an outstanding thesis. Uh, and the competition this last year was, was fierce with the numbers of people that we've had to go through their various publications and theses. And Julie, Julia won, so uh, I'll head hands off to her for her achievements. And then finally, our Lifetime Achievement Award, Bob Anderson. I don't think there could be a better winner of our Lifetime Achievement Award than Bob. And I'm so pleased that he's winning this award while I'm still director. So thank you, Bob, for this achievement. So what you see in all of this will be celebrated at the banquet. And uh, please congratulate them when you see them. And now I will introduce. 30 seconds left. Our next speaker is going to be Marco Jansen, uh, who's going to be talking about true modeling cultures. Uh, so please welcome Marco.